Thank you very much for joining. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I am Ginger Collison, the community manager, <clears throat> excuse me, for NAT um, at Synadia. Um, thanks for uh, attending our webinar, uh, Think Differently with Messaging for Cloud Native. Um, we will be um, continuing through um, the hour with our agenda. Um, first, we'll be hearing from Michael Azoff, um, OVM Principal Analyst. <clears throat> Then we'll continue on with Derek Collison, the CEO of Synadia and the creator of NAT. Um, after those two presentations, we'll continue with Michael and Derek doing a Q&A together. Um, and once those um, have concluded, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can submit your um, questions anytime during the presentation using the Q&A button um, on your uh, Zoom control. Um, you can also raise your hand um, towards the end should you want to um, have a live question. Um, with that, I think we'll begin. Um, Michael, would you like to present? Uh, thanks very much, Ginger. And um, hello, everybody. Um, so as Ginger said, I'm Michael Azov from OVM, and um, I'm going to be talking about uh, messaging in uh, applications. Uh, from a cloud native perspective, but also looking wider at the decisions um, developers uh, need to make when uh, uh, they're looking at architectures, and uh, we'll we'll talk about hybrid approaches as well. Um, so um, there's really uh, two main aims. Um, one is um, to uh, help position that in the broader landscape for messaging. Um, and just to create some understanding of when it's the right choice for using NATs. Um, and then the other um, main aim is to uh, touch on the broader uh, question of complexity that exists today in uh, application development and um, developers and businesses commissioning application development want to get a job done and uh, it, it, there is just a lot of complexity out there. So we're going to touch on, on those um, issues so let me dive in now with the uh, just looking at the at the, the software development market uh, landscape so um i think everyone's aware right uh, agile devops everything as a service microservices and the latest wave uh, cloud native computing um, containerization kubernetes um, really this was born this was created by the internet uh, giants uh, Netflix Twitter Google Amazon um, I think Netflix notably gave a lot of and Google gave a lot of open source tools into the community um, and they effectively created the cloud native paradigm even before that that terminology came into common usage um, and then the Cloud Native Computing Foundation was created a few years ago and has just grown and grown. So we're seeing these disruptions um, affecting uh, the world. Businesses are going through digital transformation, trying to, to play catch up with internet giants and, and all those startups and unicorns that are eating their lunch. Um, and many uh, of these established businesses uh, need to uh, play catch up, and they also have a lot of legacy code. They can't produce cloud native from the from from scratch, um, through and through, hundred percent as as their business. Uh, they have a lot of legacy that they also need to 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 work with to transition to modernize, and this is the reality that we're going to touch on um, as to how the majority are coping and and how they can manage um, uh, these these kind of uh, issues. Um, and in terms of what's coming over the edge, because nothing stands still, right? And the, there's going to be a huge impact um, th through 5G uh, mobile networks. The next generation um, is going to reduce latency uh, to one millisecond uh, with uh, much greater bandwidth. Um, it's uh, just the, the, the numbers are just um, amazing <laughs> if you look at uh, What's it, what's being promised by 5G, and it, it's a few years away, but it, it's going to really transform how how um, networking is done and and what's possible through networks. Um, and uh, I recently formed is the Linux Foundation Edge. Um, so one area that's going to be hugely impacted by 5G is is edge computing. 
Um, so uh, Linux Foundation Edge was created this um, this January this year. It has um, already um, over 60 uh, members. And as you can see on the diagram on the left, um, you've got uh, um, individual players uh, with IO, um, Internet of Things assets, and they all have their own uh, proprietary systems for connecting to the cloud. So LF Edge is trying to create a common stack, open source stack for interoperability. Um, and this is going to also be impacted by artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. I'm sure you've also heard of that as a, as a huge wave. And that's also going to impact the edge and edge computing. And so this is what's coming over. Uh, cloud native computing plays a big role in that. LF Edge is actually working to create a container for uh, distinctly for the edge, a lightweight container. So. Those are the things that are coming over the horizon and impacting all kinds of decisions um, for application development. So we're going to talk about messaging and applications. Just a level set, we're talking about uh, TCP IP application layer. So we're just talking about that layer, uh, not the broader networking issues. We're, we're talking about um, messaging uh, uh, between uh, and within applications, right? So if we plot the different options for uh, inter-service communication styles, so I'm, I'm using the, uh, the microservices terminology now, be, be communications between services. So uh, on the one uh, dimension, you've got synchronous and asynchronous and um, one to one uh, service communication uh, and one to many um, as the y axis. And I've plotted here the different types of messaging approaches. Um, and on the right, you'll see some of the examples of tools that are available um, to uh, provide those, those messaging um, uh, um, uh, uh, tools. Um, so what you will notice is that NATS is um, both in the async single, re single receiver and also in the multi one to many uh, receiver um, group. Um, service mesh um, has been the uh, a rising um, approach in the last uh, couple of years. Um, if you've been attending CNCF meetings, you'll have seen it happen before you rise. Um, and really, um, let's talk about that a little bit. So um, it, it addressed a, a real need because those de um, developers working with microservices were basically with each microservice having to develop the same um, um, bunch of code for um, the uh, uh, circuit breakers, the uh, timeouts, the logging, the, the retries. You know, if you try to communicate with another service and that service is being updated, then you need resiliency. The, the, the service that's making the calls can't be allowed to fall over. It needs to be resilient to an environment that is continually changing. So all of this is code that needs to be done and it needs to be done for each service. So, so that led to a pattern of the proxy um, and a number of players, including Envoy, uh, one of the prominent ones, um, basically provides that proxy which you uh, just connect with every service and uh, it's also called a sidecar. Um, so that deals with the data plane. Um, and then um, for, for providing uh, security and governance, um, the control plane um, started being developed uh, out and um, open source um, uh, tools emerged. And Istio is, is one of the, the, the front runners with that. So uh, Istio uses the Envoy proxies for, for the data plane. So uh, if we go back to here, you'll see that the service mesh is really designed for one-to-one um, uh, -one, um, uh, communication. So one service uh, connected to another. Um, and um, the other uh, uh, example is Kafka, um, which has emerged again. If we come back to here, we'll see that Kafka uh, sweet spot is one to, to many in the bottom right there. Um, 
And Kafka has emerged as, as a leading um, publish subscribe um, tool. Um, so instead of having a jungle of uh, connectivity, um, Kafka is there to provide um, some control and management of messaging um, and uh, allowing different uh, uh, groups uh, for to subscribe to different messages, message types, and so on. So um, I think what's interesting. Um, here is that um, there's activity around hybrid using multiple messaging depending on how an application uh, needs to communicate and finding the right sweet spot um, hybrid uh, is one approach and I want to mention Nats at this point so uh, largely this is going to be bookmarking for for Derek is going to speak after me um, but I want to point out that um, there are sweet spots for NATs, and this is really what we want to try and bring across um, so that you can make the right decisions. But if we go back to that slide here, you will see that NATs fits into the um, one to many um, uh, communication mode between services. But NATs has a number of paradigms and it is, is very uh, flexible and is also in the in the one to one um, category. So um, this is one of its uh, advantages is that, is that it has multiple paradigms for for messaging styles that it can support. So as I said, I'm bookmarking this for for Derek, who's going to be talking after me. So I want to touch on the, the second um, reason for um, this um, webinar is really to touch on on that complexity issue that especially if you're one of these large enterprises you're coming into this new world of cloud native you're going through digital transformation you're still trying to get your development teams to adopt DevOps um, CI CD um, and then there are all these technologies that you need to get to speed with um, and it is it is quite a hurdle it is quite a, a challenge um, if you uh, mentioned the CNCF um, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, an umbrella nonprofit part of the Lynx Foundation, um, and they um, uh, uh, Google donated the Kubernetes uh, project to them. Kubernetes, uh, as you, you may know, is the leading cloud uh, uh, containerization um, orchestration tool. But I'm not expecting you to read this slide, and the reason is. To sh putting this slide here is to show you that complexity that is facing developers, especially new to cloud native, is that there's just so many tools out there. Which ones do you use? How do they work together? Um, it is it is not easy. That's that's the point of showing this slide. Um, and the CNCF is doing its best, uh, clearly, to, to to help navigate. Um, but you know, when CNCF started, this slide was readable on one on one page and now it's you have to drill down uh, within this um, uh, on their website to get further details so the complexity has increased now the uh, chart the graphic on the left is something that I have seen a lot um, where on the um, vertical axis we have the the scale low scale at bottom to high scale internet scale at the top and then the complexity running from left to right less complex to more complex and microservices by and large is in that internet internet scale category but also a lot of people recognize it for its um, reduction of complexity because if you have very large monolithic applications you've seen that hairball diagram where all these different parts of the application connect with the other parts and microservices do simplify that through decoupling so they have very real advantages in that respect but if you go over to the right um, diagram I've now switched the um, positioning of the complexity uh, between monoliths and microservices and this is because um, it's not a one decision um, uh, issue there are other dimensions and aspects that need to be considered when you choose the right architecture. And um, for certain applications, and especially ones that are um, not at an internet scale um, and are relatively small, I would say, um, and, and, and not needing that, that kind of hairball situation, uh, monoliths can be a lot less complex than the microservices. So let's explain what I mean by that. So 
Um, as I said, microservices on the right, the good points, highly decoupled code, scalability. This, this leads to the advantages in scalability that we have um, multiple teams are able to work independently. Um, they also scale very well in production. Maintenance and debugging is easier. They're easier to write. But the biggest advantage is fast change response and rapid to market. Um, and then the modern lithic, the good points, is that the in-process messaging is very, very simple. Um, they're easy to write and deploy. They have the ACID um, uh, database uh, guarantee for transactions. But I'll, but the really the the top reason is that the performance is highest. So investment bankers who need very fast algorithms to run in their applications will still be writing monoliths. And I've also mentioned the challenges, the overheads in infrastructure, the performance lag with microservices, the complexity of, of the messaging um, uh, tools that we need to implement, uh, eventual consistency for data transactions, and also some of the challenges around DevOps culture adoption and so on is, is still a challenge for large um, enterprises with legacy um, skills. Um, and similarly, of course, we know that there are these challenges with monolithic. So um, I'm not going to go further into this, but the point is that there are these differences and you need to decide when to use one architecture versus another. Um, so it's not, the world isn't all um, nails. If all you have is, is one, is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's, uh, there are multiple use cases and we need to understand these different advantages and different advantages of the, 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 the architectures to decide which is the right one. So, um, again, I'm bookmarking for Derek is going to follow me. Um, he's the expert on that and he's going to tell you a lot more. Um, just to mention um, security is one of the biggest reasons for adopting at, uh, NATS. Um, looking at different architectures, um, we mentioned the complexity issues and, and hybrid architectures is another approach and making the right decision for your messaging um, that um, ha has a say in that and then a whole bunch of other reasons very fast easy to um, set up uh, low cost it's open source uh, highly scalable so um, I think I'm going to let uh, Derek take over so thank you very much and Derek over to you Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen. So Michael talked a lot about um, kind of the complexity that's kind of invaded our, our landscape, so to speak, as developers or, or operators or, of course, uh, DevOps themselves um, and the choices that we have. And I think this is a natural progression. Um, we've always wanted to look at creating software in, in a decoupled and, and decomposed way. Um, and what's really interesting about today's landscape is, is that we actually now have the tools and the technologies to make that such that it's possible. Um, but we still have to deal with some of the complexity. And as you make one thing into 10 things, um, how those things coordinate um, how they talk to each other, how they um, collaborate, and how you observe their interactions um, is kind of where the, the role of communications technologies um, comes in. And that's where NATS is. NATS was originally built to power Cloud Foundry, which was a early platform as a service uh, that was created at VMware and is now part of Pivotal. So in terms of what is NATS, I mean, what really is it? It's it's a simple and secure, um, but very much production proven messaging technology for modern distributed systems. Uh, you can think of it as doing two things, services and streams. Services is when you're asking a question and you get an answer back. So very similar to uh, the RPC, HTTP type interactions that kind of drive uh, your user's experiences, whether it's a web page, a mobile app, or, or even uh, the microservices as Michael alluded to. Um, our philosophy is extremely easy to use for both developers and operators. It's highly resilient, just means that it self heals itself. So it, it's more like a cattle than a pet, um, meaning you can simply have a deployment platform that says run one of these, and if it fails, run another one, and that's all we need to go from a single server deployment all the way up to global uh, super clusters, which we'll talk about. 
Um, it's highly secure, and security is usually an afterthought. Um, and I think today's developers and architects and, and engineers are realizing that that's probably not the, the right approach. And we want this built in, or at least thought about it at the beginning. Um, and that tries very hard to make it not only highly secure, but by default and keep that philosophy of, of very, very simple to use. Um, Stream light weight and performance. Uh, I think the server is about eight meg big, runs in less than 20 meg of, of memory on startup, uh, meaning that you can run this thing not like a the old school message brokers where you have to have the biggest machine and all these these um, hardware resource constraints. Uh, this thing will run on a Raspberry Pi. It can run on you know a phone. It can run on all kinds of things. Um, and we have an amazing ecosystem. I, I created NATS to, to power Cloud Foundry, but the power of NATS now is in the ecosystem and the amount of people that are participating um, and communicating on Slack and other mediums uh, around uh, this ecosystem. As Michael mentioned, we're a cloud native uh, project. Um, we have both Kubernetes and Prometheus integrations. And the other thing is we're applicable in cloud on-premise edge and IoT, meaning we're deployment agnostic. You don't have to deploy us through Kubernetes and through a service mesh. You can if you want, um, but you can also deploy us with just plain Docker or the old school, you know, chef puppet types of, of integrations and, and deployment methodologies. Uh, messaging is important just because, again, the, the, the world is becoming complex uh, in terms of the number of moving pieces. Um, your software deployment um, system will be the simplest it ever was today, and it'll be more complex tomorrow. And so understanding how you're going to coordinate and observe those things is, is extremely important. A lot of the messaging technologies today um, were built for static systems. Uh, I've been around in this industry long enough to remember it's just the requester was on one you know, machine and the server was on another machine, and you knew the IP, and it didn't change for years, right? And and that was that service model where I'd ask a question and get an answer back, whether it was a database or, or whatever. Um, you didn't have to configure endpoints very often. They were onerous sometimes, but it was very, very infrequent. Um, they were very small usually, um, meaning the number of moving pieces and the number of uh, hardware resource that were needed. Um, but every time you wanted to change something, it was either a help desk, you know, request ticket, or provisioning of hardware or additional software. Uh, but they were static and predictable. Um, and when I say predictable, I mean you knew what they were going to do, including when they would fall over, right, if you, you put too much pressure on them. Um, but predictability is, is something that I think we all as an industry should strive for in um, distributed systems, especially as the complexity rises. Um, I think digital communications of tomorrow is, is a very grand term, but I believe from the from the earlier slide, it needs to uh, adapt and understand security and, and have it by default and understand different security domains. It should do the main pattern, services, request reply, and should do streams, right? That observability component that, that we're all starting to want. Um, and it should be able to scale and it should be extremely lightweight and just easy, in, in my opinion. And I think where we're getting as an industry, and I don't know if it will happen, you know, this year or in 2020 or maybe uh, further down the line, but I think the progression that we see with, you know, deployable platforms and things like service mesh and microservices and all of these, these technologies is akin really to kind of the, the way we went through the combustion engine and the, the combustion engine just had so much complexity and so much technology over a century of people working on this problem. Um, and for great reason, uh, right? Transportation, you know, gained us independence and just expanded us as, as a human race, uh, really. Um, but then there was that thing, at least for me and, and some other people, that, that Tesla moment where, hey, it still has a steering wheel, still has a gas pedal and brake, but all that complexity is replaced by something really simple. And it just works. And it's, it's very easy to, uh, you don't need to service it. You don't need to put gas in it. You don't need to do any of those things. I believe there's going to be this type of a moment transition for uh, these types of technologies. And I think where Michael was showing some of the CNCF landscape, I think we're in that run up of lots of different technologies trying to solve lots of different problems. And I think as users or consumers of this technology, um, I, I think I can at least hint at, I think that is going to slowly um, 
you know, slow down, and now we're going to start consolidating and, and simplifying. Um, but we needed to go through that that time period where we kept adding more and more things to solve different problems. So as Mike mentioned, we're part of the CNCF. Uh, he gave the iChart version. I'm just going to give the simple version. Right now, we're, we're kind of stuck in the stream and messaging and the remote procedure call. Uh, but again, if, if I wanted to try to simplify just the discussion, think of it as, hey, am I doing a service where I'm sending a request and getting an answer back? Um, or am I actually streaming out either events or, or data? Um, and of course, there's, there's more to services, which we'll, we'll describe in a second, especially in, in today's modern world of it's not on a single machine and I'm not a single requester. So some of the use cases for this, obviously cloud messaging, again, services like we talked about, event and data streaming. So observability, telemetry, analytics, um, ML and AI, uh, which is kind of the progression from analytics where you're looking at something like Hadoop um, or doing um, more simplistic uh, threshold modeling to also ML algorithms that are watching inputs for anomalies and security violations and compliance violations. All of this shouldn't affect the, the endpoints that are actually trying to do uh, the end user experience, right? The, the request reply, the, the fast path is what I call it. Um, and then command and control. Uh, command and control is essentially one of the first uh, problems I was trying to solve with Cloud Foundry was how do we actually change state in a distributed system like Cloud Foundry, which was a, again a platform as a service. But we also believe, you know, as you transition to IoT and Edge, you know, right now the industry will ask you to make a change in technologies. So if you're using Kafka for observability after the fact, and you're using gRPC over HTTP for your request reply, and now you're using Service Mesh, when you get to IoT. You might hear words like MQTT and edge gateways and, you know, totally different security and authentication domains versus what's running in your back end. And we believe, again, there's going to be an opportunity in, in the future where those, if they can be um, satisfied with, with a single technology that allows multiple security domains, but it's familiar and it's ubiquitous, um, we, we think there's an amazing opportunity that exists there. Um, this slide I'll go fast uh, on um, just we've been doing this a long time um, it's definitely not an IQ thing it's more of a, a scars on the back thing around how these systems can um, evolve and, and I started in 92 um, mostly around uh, financial systems vertical and, and trying to um, enable a stock distribution a stock quote distribution such that instead of a model like a telephone call where I call the first person and hang up and go all the way to the end of the line, that everyone could kind of tune into kind of a radio broadcast so that it was fair. Um, we really believed, um, at least I did in the 90s, that that was very specific to the problem at hand within the financial industry and that it wouldn't really take off. Um, Tipco, however, did make a, an amazing company out of the fact that there would be other verticals and other customers that would need that. Um, but it's not until almost like today, to be honest with you, that we've kind of gone back and said, hey, we might need something that, that has um, you know, a, a simplified uh, approach to things, but it can fit multiple um, scenarios. It can fit that request reply model for services. It can fit that streaming model for real-time observability and, and analytics and things like that. Uh, our DNA is, is ease of use, simplicity, security, performance. Um, we do a lot of work on our resiliency where the system can self-heal itself. So if a server falls over, it puts itself back together. If a client falls over, it puts itself back together. And it can run anywhere and everywhere, um, which we think as, again, the complexity keeps um, pushing us um, towards those, those complex models, that's something that simplifies, um, yet gives us kind of still what we want, that decoupling of software, that microservices architecture, that observability and security all in one, we think becomes attractive. So in 2.0, which we released in June, um, we really started pushing hard on security. Um, we kept seeing these systems being compromised where passwords were being compromised and things like that. And so we pushed to say NAT should never have passwords or private keys of, of any sort. Um, it should be able to transfer from IoT to edge to cloud to on-premise. Um, it should try to reduce the operational complexity, not add to it. Um, and it should understand the notion of disaster recovery, multiple deployment technologies, 
uh, fitting customers where they are, right, and not forcing them into a brand new paradigm for all development, because that's just not the way enterprises work. Uh, we believe, you know, that total cost of ownership is going to be a big factor, right? As customers get these very complex solutions up and running, uh, and they get those first couple months of cloud bills, they're going to say, "Hey, wait a minute, is there an easier, simpler, you know, and to be honest with you, cheaper way to achieve what we're trying to achieve?" And that time to value, complexity slows things down, as Michael alluded to, right? Where monoliths used to be, um, you know, complex because of all the interactions inside, microservices are complex because of all the infrastructure needed to kind of set all of these up. Um, and so you have to be aware of how that complexity landscape has shifted from development of, you know, a single microservice to actually putting them all together and stitching them together. So 2.0 was our largest release. Um, we really want to create a new way of thinking about a, a communication technology as a shared utility, not a silo technology where you have five versions of this in your enterprise and then someone raises their hand as they always do and say, ooh, why don't we put them together as a shared utility? And depending on the technology, if it's not really built for that, that's usually a painful process inside of an enterprise that takes months and months and months and usually ends um, in failure or at least disappointment. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we could be used as a global secure shared utility, either within an enterprise or as a, a global utility. So we released on uh, June 10th. It was about a year and a half worth of uh, work um, that the, the team put in. Um, and this team is an amazing team. Plus again, we're backed by an amazing ecosystem. Um, of technologists and, and just enthusiastic users and customers. Documentation is usually a boring word, but uh, we really put a lot of effort in, and I, my hats off to Ginger, uh, who's on the call, who kind of corralled that effort of really making our documentation a first-class citizen of us, always pointing to that now. It has search, it has all of the topics, um, and it really helps, uh, I think, people self-educate themselves about what Nats is outside of, hey, it's a technology that can do services and streams. I kind of get it. Okay, what do I actually need to do to get kind of started? Uh, that's the link uh, to get to it. You can also get to everything with just Nats.io, um, which will bring you to the Nats landing page. It has links for documentation, GitHub repos, um, hopefully everything you need. If not, please uh, let us know. So one of the things that that we were trying to do with Nats was truly create something that had secure multi-tenancy. Um, in the old days, we used to call it the Coke and Pepsi problem, meaning Coke and Pepsi could use it, but neither could see each other's recipe. And, and it, it sounds funny, and we also used to say FedEx and UPS, but it was a very real thing. Um, and so Nats took a very, very hard and serious look at how we would provide that. And the way we do that is with accounts. So think of them as containers for messaging. Once you're in your own container, everyone who else is in that container, or pod if you, if you uh, are um, well-versed in, in Kubernetes uh, lingo, um, can see each other, can talk to each other with the right permissioning and authorization, but for most part, they all can see each other. The question was, is how do we actually go between accounts? And so we actually created a technology that allows accounts to export either a stream or service, you'll hear me say that quite a bit, um, and then other accounts can import them. So uh, you can think of it as a mutual agreement, it has to be um, both sides but it is a secure transformation of, of messaging from one account to another. And what's really interesting is, is that the account that's importing the information, they decide where it shows up on terms of the subject space. So, so Nats is, a, is at, at its core is a proven technology called Publish Subscribe, which uses subjects to, to create addressing uh, domains, meaning I will send to a subject, let's say foo.bar, and anyone who's listening to foo.bar or a wildcard, like foo.star that matches, will receive the message. Um, and we're allowed to you know, build extremely powerful request reply at high speed streaming and actually the combination of both. Um, for example, even with services, load balancing is just built in. You just run more of the uh, responders and you can deploy them any way you want. And they, the system automatically dynamically understands that they are part of a group and it's you know to, to speed up the service and then you can of course scale them down. Accounts allows us though to formalize that, um, that boundary, which also gives us something very interesting that early customers started to recognize, which is if you have an account that has imports, that's essentially your dependencies. 
That's what you're depending on. That's your other services that you're depending on or data streams. And of course your exports is your API. You know, what are you actually exporting? A service where someone can ask you a question, you give them an answer, or a stream of, of information, either events or, or, or data streams. We also introduced the notion of system account. And, and again, this is just a, a problem that needed a solution. We didn't have one until accounts came along, which is the servers themselves now are sending messages, but they do it inside of a system account that has the same security model, the same multi-tenancy, the same rules as all the other accounts. But you can actually, if, if you have authorization, import services from that system account or streams and see what the system is doing. So it's great for that observability, that monitoring uh, aspect. We also realized that if we wanted to provide a utility, we needed to understand the notion of a global deployment. And um, Nats had a network topology that allowed it to run in a single server mode or a, a full mesh cluster mode. And with um, Nats 2.0, we actually added in uh, two other networking topologies that allow us to create what we call super clusters. And we actually, as uh, Synadia, run one today that spans all cloud providers and all geos and is available via a single URL. And we believe that over time, these are going to be extremely interesting um, to utilize, not necessarily from a direct application or, or services standpoint, but as a cluster that you're running on your own, a small cluster that then uses NGS to bridge geos or to reduce latency for things, but use services that would be embedded into a global network like that. So you can think of super clusters as clusters of clusters. And, and again, this can start to look like, wow, this could be complex, but we've worked very hard to make these extremely easy to set up and to administer and monitor. Leaf nodes is one of those network topologies that we think is very interesting. And you can think of it as simply a bridge from on-premise and into the cloud or bridging from a certain security domain to another security domain. What I mean by that, think of like IoT. So you have field deployables, either hardware sensors or, or software uh, that's out there that uses a certain security domain to identify themselves and authorize themselves to, to communicate. And there's a different one that actually runs uh, in your cloud or on-premise in your data center. Um, and that provides a technology that allows you to use the same technology and bridge both of those securely and transparently. There's no guessing if, if you know, well, when they move from this into this DMZ and they go from user password on MQTT to um, OAuth or Spiffy on the back end, what, what's happening there? Um, and so we think this is extremely powerful um, and it allows you again to use, uh, extend these super clusters with hub and spokes into uh, in single servers or smaller um, cluster servers that run in your domain and might have a different security domain uh, as we mentioned. So Nats has always had the notion of, of Q subscribers. And it's you can think of it as just a subscriber that says, I want to be part of a group. Um, so let's say I want to be a part of the group open. Um, and the system does not have to be configured. It does not have to restart servers, uh, no matter how big your cluster topology is. Um, and the system automatically will randomly select subscribers as each individual message is trying to be delivered to them. Um, what we did with Nats 2.0 is in terms of super clusters, uh, again, no changes to your client applications, no config changes. The system automatically will prefer um, responders that are con connected to your cluster that you're connected to. Uh, but if they aren't available, it will actually select other clusters that are the closest RTT away. And so you can actually have a bunch of responders running in Google on the West Coast and then have some on Amazon in the East Coast. And your client application never changes. It just asks the question and gets an answer. And all of a sudden you might notice it takes a little bit longer. Um, but you know, if the West Coast for some reason goes out, the system automatically self-heals itself. Um, it's, it's really impressive to see. And, and I, I would invite anyone who has more questions about it to please contact me or, or the team or, or jump on uh, the Slack channel because it's a, uh, it's pretty interesting to see uh, in person. And this is kind of a, a quick uh, guide of what that kind of looks like. But as you run these um, responders, these services that just say, hey, I want to listen to a request, um, again, they can be deployed in any deployment platform, Docker, Kubernetes, just run as a binary. 
Um, they are deployment agnostic and cloud agnostic and geo agnostic. And the system, NATS, will actually allow you to do things which uh, today are now kind of possible, but there's a lot of moving parts to understand you know, the role of service mesh doing load balancing then versus you know, service mesh falling over to another service mesh in a different cloud provider in a different geo. That's kind of just gives you this all in one simple package, one single binary. And this is kind of illustrating what that might look like. The other thing at scale is centralized security becomes uh, brittle and it becomes very difficult. And, and the, the way you'll know you're into one of these models, whether it's the complexity of the system itself or the security model is, you say, hey, can you change this? And you get, no. <laughs> and, and I think all of us have experienced that, that once the system is up, it, it kind of um, gets solidified to the point of nobody wants to change it. And, and modern systems have to invite change. They have to be inviting of uh, adapting to um, new services coming online, new requirements, things like that. And so NATS is um, decentralized uh, in NATS 2.0. Um, NATS security today, before 2.0, it had full TLS support, DNRSAN for, for user identity, standard user password, things like that, permissioning for individual users on what they're allowed to communicate on. Um, and again, all of these changes can be reloaded in a server with zero downtime of the server. You just send it a signal, it reloads and goes uh, about its business. Very similar to things like HE proxy or, or Nginx. Um, but in 2.0, we now have an operator mode. And the operator mode essentially says, I trust an operator. And an operator will sign and vouch for accounts, and then accounts sign for and vouch for users. So you can already see that everything in terms of management of users, who can actually access the system, has nothing to do with the operator. Um, at all, meaning in NGS, you are responsible for creating your users and their permissions and what they're allowed to do, where they're allowed to connect from, what subjects they can listen to and, and send to without ever involving anything uh, in, in terms of an operator. Uh, for example, with NGS, that would be Synadia, although we've designed it to be federated, meaning multiple operators can actually operate a, a global network. Again, accounts, that container for meshing defines limits and, and exposes those services and streams, you know, your, your, your API. Um, the technology we use under the cover, we won't dig into it too deep, but it's, it's forward looking. We never want the system to have any private keys or passwords, so it's based on PKI. Um, we have chosen for the time E25519, which was um, attractive when we first started learning about those side channel attacks like Spectre and Meltdown. Um, and that's the only algorithm we use to sign our JWTs. Uh, and JWTs um, are, are JSON web tokens, and they kind of form the basis of a lot of the, the internet level um, authentication mechanisms like OAuth and OAuth2 and things like that. This is some details on just what these things look like, which I'll skip over. Um, and again, more information, please contact me directly or, or anyone or info at nats.io will work as well. Um, extremely uh, proud of the community. It's, it's growing very fast. This is just a small sampling of some of the people that um, use and depend on NATS to, to power um, a lot of their internal systems and user-facing systems. Um, and for example, Docker, whether it's a good, good uh, metric or not, we just know that uh, the number of times uh, the NAT server gets pulled on Docker um, has continued to rise at a very, very steady uh, upward and to the right rate. We're now over 40 million downloads, uh, which we think is, is great. And uh, it's a great way to bring uh, NAT's technology into your deployment platform, whether it's Docker or Kubernetes or, or whatever. Synadia is the company that actually kind of um, hosts the, the core maintainers for NATS. Um, we uh, employ most of the core maintainers of the, the project itself. Again, though, we have an amazing ecosystem of hundreds of people and thousands of people on the Slack channels that are using and, and contributing to the, to the system. Um, Synadia does several things. We run that global utility that's based on NATS 2.0, um, all open source. Um, again, single URL um, gets you connectivity to any cloud, any geo uh, around the globe. And again, you can extend that into your on-premise deployments with leaf nodes. So love to help you with that if you want to. And of course, we do consulting and NRE and training and education and support. Um, and so that's who Synadia is and that's how they fit in with the, the NATS ecosystem. 
So thank you. I appreciate it. I probably went a little longer than, than we wanted to. Um, but what we'll do now is we'll kind of open it up to questions and um, we'll go from there. Um, so thanks for that. So um, my first question for you is that if um, you're talking to a cloud native developer and clearly they, they are inundated with service meshes and Kafka's, uh, um, approach. How do you position that for this kind of developer? Um, what is the decision making they need to make um, as to whether NATS is appropriate for their needs? And what 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 are the scenarios where they might want to consider NATS, uh, maybe in a hybrid scenario? So how do you approach that? That's a great question, and and we always try to um, augment with with current investments from users and, and customers for sure. Um, but if you're getting to the point where you find yourself saying it shouldn't be this hard, it shouldn't be this complex, you know, I shouldn't be using 12 gig of, of RAM and 10 nodes to do 200 requests a second and just be able to observe what's kind of going on. If, if those are the types of questions that you're asking yourself, um, I would encourage you to take a look um, at, at Nats again with the, the documentation uh, as it exists today and the Slack channel, it's great to self-educate and get help without ever having to engage with the core team, which sometimes is a good thing and sometimes it can be, um, you know, not what you want to do. You want to kind of get an honest opinion. Um, we have a lot of enthusiastic users. Um, they're both enthusiastic when we do things well um, and when we don't do things well. And, and I actually invite and encourage both. Um, but if you're facing complexity and, and a lot of moving pieces before you even get the first service actually sending responses, you know, and you you're, feel like you're, you've spent three months on just setting up a POC before you even get into, um, you know, the domain knowledge and, and what your company or your organization is trying to do for the business, um, NAS is an extremely simple solution to a lot of those problems without any additional moving parts, which is really nice. Right, and if you're um, so, so the other, so my understanding is that there are two flavors of NATS. There's NATS Core and NATS Streaming. One holds state, the other doesn't. Um, one guarantees at most one delivery, the other guarantees at least one delivery. So, um, how how do you decide between these two flavors? Yeah, and I think that's that's also a great question. And, and at least from our perspective, you know, it's it's a NATS ecosystem that provides the technology to do services, um, which, by the way, sh should not be using anything except fire and forget. Meaning, if you're going to ask a question and wait for the answer and have to do something if you don't get the answer or or you time out, asking a a messaging technology to save something on disk or in memory and replicate it and all that other stuff simply makes no sense. It's almost an anti pattern. However, as you start talking about observability, right, I, I want to observe these interactions, usually asynchronously or after the fact is what I call them. You usually want to see all of those interactions and be able to go through those in, in kind of like a stream fashion. And that's very akin to what Kafka does and what Kafka brings to a lot of customers who probably are, are listening to this. Um, and so NAS provides both that um, at most once, that fire and forget, which again is um, my go-to, I, I build almost all of the resilient systems with just that primitive and do request reply and streaming both with that quality of service. But for those who want it and those who need it, and it is needed in, in certain instances, um, that streaming um, allows you to actually collect these messages, store them, and then replay them at any rate you want at any point in time to do analytics or machine learning or what have you. Right, and the streaming does the the offsetting, so that you 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 know the order of the messages um, when you need to know, right? Yes, exactly. So once the stream is captured in that streaming, that order is is guaranteed for all subscribers um, past that point in time. Right. So um, one of the the big questions that that we touched on was around uh, the complexity and and. Um, just trying to make the right decisions about architectures. Um, and I guess NATS is there because um, it's an option that um, simplifies a lot of that complexity away. And uh, would you agree to say that in, for enterprises with a whole range of different 
uh, types of architectures in play, NATS is very is very good in that hybrid scenario. So you may be running communications from edge um, to to your cloud, and you could be running uh, cloud native um, uh, applications in your cloud, and you could be running something quite different on the edge. So um, could you just explore explore that for us? Sure. So, uh, you know, I, I think the best way to kind of explore that um, is, is just with a really simple kind of example. Um, so let's say you have a service that you want to write and it adds two numbers. Uh, obviously, that makes no sense, but let's say it, it exists. And so in that, you, you write a line of code that says subscribe to add and I'm going to be part of the add service. OK, and essentially you run one of these and then you write something that says send a request to the ad with one and two and you get three back. And so within, you know, less than a minute, two minutes with some copy and paste, you can have an extremely simple, you know, requester and responder. And that's that service model, right, that we talk about. Now, what's interesting about NATS is, is that you might say, well, eventually I'm going to run out of runway and I'm going to have to look at something more complex. Um, similar to what cloud native architectures are doing today, where you move from just HTTP and maybe a load balancer to something full on like service mesh. But remember, NATS is based on a technology, a proven technology, publish, subscribe. And it's, NATS itself is almost 10 years old, and the technology is based on learnings from you know hundreds of years, believe it or not, of experience between all of the team members that, that have been doing this for most of their career. And so when you say, oh wow, you know, the ad service is slowing down, we're getting more requests in, Nats's answer is simply run another one. You don't have to deploy it a certain way, you don't have to configure anything differently, you don't have to do anything, just run another one. Now all of a sudden there's two participating, and then you run 10, and then you run 20. Now all of a sudden you say, well, I want to observe this. I want to, I want to see what's going on. Well, again, that's is a, a pub subsystem, which means you can run an application and say, I want to observe every time someone sends an ad request in and the answer going back, and I'm going to measure latency and do some compliance checking or whatever. And, and so that system, those, that requester and that responder that you wrote in the first minute of using that still hasn't changed. You haven't touched a line of code, and yet now you're looking at a system that can scale up, can scale down, is deployment agnostic, cloud agnostic, is observable. You can obviously easily import this into um, NAT streaming such that if you want to, you can just replay these things at a later date um, or, or whenever you need to, to, to analyze those. And I think that the power of a system that that single technology can do that um, is where the power comes in. It's in that simplicity, but it can do those things that everyone wants it to do, right? But it doesn't keep making you change either your applications or your operations, which a lot of technologies today do. Right, and because it has a very small footprint, it's it's um, ideal for edge computing, right? Yeah. So the Docker image, I think I could be wrong, but it's like five meg big. Uh, you know, so it, it runs very well on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, I haven't run it on the new Raspberry Pi four, but I, you know, it's going to run even faster. Um, but but on an iMac, the iMac I'm, I'm presenting on here, you know, a single binary server can do single stream, you know, 18 million plus messages a second, just it by itself. Um, if you put a whole bunch of, uh, you know, services and streams onto the system, it can get up to about 80, almost 90 million a, a second. And most people, almost all people will never have the um, need to do that. However, here's where the kicker comes in. You don't need 18 million messages a second, but you love it that your 100 messages a second is or extremely efficient and can run on a cloud computer that costs you two bucks a month versus 5,000, 6,000, 8,000. And so those operating costs, you know, start to build up. Right, thanks very much. So um, I guess, Ginger, we're, we're coming up to the hour. Yes, we are. Um, we do have a couple questions from the audience. Um, if folks can stay on just a few minutes over. Um, the first question uh, from Jarius in the chat. Um, could you talk a little bit about NAT streaming um, part for use cases that are more common with uh, Kafka, at least one from repeatability? Yeah, so we can definitely talk about at least once, but I think from a from a higher level, it's like what what is Kafka good at, or what was it designed to do? It was designed to collect um, events, probably originally logs, um, right, in LinkedIn, similar to what Google was doing with GFS. Uh, at least when I was there, we used still use GFS for log collection, and to then analyze 
all of those logs or all of those events. And Kafka does that well, and it actually has the ability to query um, across those. Um, and so NAT streaming, you can think of it as something that can augment you know, a Kafka installation. Um, we have open source bridges to Kafka, um, but if you're looking for something that allows you to do that, hey, I want a stream of messages persisted that I can replay, but I want something really lightweight and really simple and easy to get going with, I think that streaming is a great complement to, to Kafka in that scenario. Okay, we had another question um, from Daniel, and um, he says, I've heard NATS is best for a control plane versus a data plane. How would you qualify that? And why not use it for all service-to-service -service communications? Is there a problem with large payloads? So I think that is a great question. And, and I will be frank that when I designed NATS uh, almost 10 years ago, it was specifically for control plane. And I said, do something different for the data plane, um, whether it be HTTP. And again, I think everyone loves HTTP, um, but maybe not for the right reasons. That's an assumption we should probably start to challenge. Uh, but I, I would always say that early on. Um, where my, my view changed, uh, and I'm not saying that NATS is perfect for the data plane yet, but where my, my opinion changed very quickly was is when we really dug into the security model and we felt really good about the security model that we put together for uh, identity authentication authorization in NATS 2.0, uh, I kind of said, wow, it's really sad if we have all of this power and flexibility around this powerful security and, and um, auth system. And then once you actually want to move an asset, we say, use something else. Um, so internally, we've already started playing around with um, things like chunkers and things like that that can transparently chunk things up into smaller pieces and deliver them. The reason that NATS was originally designed um, with a payload limit and it still exists today, is, is that NATS is routing on messages. And so it has to stage the whole message before it can actually route it, um, before it gets to the next message in terms of clients. And so sending very, very large messages actually kind of starts to slow um, the system down potentially. Um, and so what we wanted to push people towards was um, use small messages, right, for command and control. Now, as we move forward, we think there's a huge amount of power to say, hey, I'm going to deliver you a crest because I'm looking for an asset, and I can actually retrieve that asset that might be bigger than a, a single NATS message, but I can maintain that security and identity and all of the really cool stuff that's in NATS 2.0. So uh, I'm changing my stance on it. We're not there yet, um, but love to hear more, so definitely ping me directly, and I'll, I'll, I'll dive in even deeper too kind of where my, my head's at in terms of, of me, making NATS applicable for more use cases in the data plane. Maybe not all, but a lot more. Okay, thank you. Uh, one uh, last question I see on the Q&A from Julian. What are the impl implications using the same NATS cluster for high volume metrics data and more refined RPC for control command? So uh, I think that's a great question. Um, the the NAT system is um, very responsive, so uh, definitely test it uh, on your own. However, um, we we see no reason using not to use the same cluster, right? Again, and we have that secure multi tenancy, so you can actually securely separate out the traffic. Um, but the system is very good at processing uh, messages as they they show up um, from lots of different clients, and uh, you know for those who who um, don't know the NAT server is written in a programming language called Go, um, which invites uh, the, the ability to do concurrency and, of course, then use uh, multiple hardware resources if they exist. And so we take full advantage of that. So as multiple connections are trying to send and receive messages, um, the server, for the most part, is extremely good at scaling with lots of activity and, and lots of messages. We we hear quite often, oh, wow, we thought it would be faster, and we do the calculations, and they're saturating a 10 gigabit link. <laughs> I mean, easily saturating the whole thing. Um, and so test it. Let us know if there's any uh, um, issues. But no, there's no problems at all using a single cluster for, for different types of traffic flows. Great. That's our last question that I see. If anybody else has a question, feel free to enter it in the Q&A um, or in chat. Or you can raise your hand if you'd ask to, uh, like to ask a live question. Uh, can we expect from NATS team to provide something like a NATS transport for gRPC? It could be useful to migrate an old app to messaging. 
I think that's also a great question. And the, the community ecosystem actually already has a, a, a version of gRPC that uses NATS as a transport. I think it's called NRPC. Um, if you're on the Slack channel, um, you know, ping me directly or shoot me an email, just Derek at NATS.io, and I'll get you the link. But if you Google search uh, for NATS space gRPC, I think it will immediately come up uh, as well. Um, we also are looking at it. We believe there's some value into binding transports and, and the semantics of payloads um, in, in terms of encodings. And so the team's been looking at different ways that we can provide that for the ecosystem. Um, we don't think it's the right thing to immediately pin yourself to only a request response because again, uh, you start adding moving pieces and complexity when you want to load balance and um, DR and observability. So we like the, the, the pure pub sub tech that, that runs underneath of that, but we do realize the ubiquity of gRPC and, and we've, we've been asked it several times, so we are thinking pretty hard about it. Thanks, Derek. This concludes our presentation for today. I want to thank our guests, uh, Michael Azoff and Derek Collison. If you have any other questions, please contact us at info at nats.io or join us on our Nats Slack channel. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.